It's July of 1966, and the tides of rock and roll are changing. Everything from Eastern philosophy to avant-garde jazz influences this new thing called psychedelia. It's taking hold in all the cultural capitals of the day, from Laurel Canyon to Carnaby Street. The Beatles have just wrapped production on their own foray into psych, Revolver, when urgent news comes from across the pond. The reigning king of rock and roll, Bob Dylan, is involved in a serious motorcycle cycle crash. Dylan withdrew from the public eye for the next several years, holing up with his wife and kids away from prying eyes in Woodstock. He overhauled his approach to music, drifting from the thin wild mercury sound and all its rock star trappings to country and jamming with his band. Well, the band. Psychedelia ran rampant in his absence. Dylan's mysterious crash and his recovery period started a butterfly effect that led a certain Liverpoolian devotee to finally come into his own. Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this is a special episode of Vinyl Monday. Welcome everyone to the Vinyl Monday mid-season special! If you're new here, Vinyl Monday is the who, what, when, where, why, and how do I feel about classic albums in my collection. It's so much more than a review. Today especially. If deep dives aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as TikTok. I am so excited to bring you this episode today. We are halfway through the third year of this series, and I finally get to bring you my favorite album by my favorite Beatle. There's a lot to cover today, so pray for editing, Abby. I have no idea how long this episode is gonna be. The Vinyl Monday mid-season special is... George Harrison all things must pass. Congrats if you guessed this one, or if you voted on this one. To those of you who voted Ziggy Redux, don't worry, it will happen in the future. I really wanted to do that one too. If you wanna play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls, make announcements, you can find all of that on my channel. It seems we're already deviating from the usual format because, well, I have no plastic to take off this one. This is a box set. The first box set on Vinyl Monday. So let's just get right into what copies I have. This is actually my second, a US original on Apple Records. And my first, right here, is a 1976 repress on Capitol with the red labels. Judging by the nice big hole punch in the corner that goes through all of the inner sleeves and the poster, this was unsold stock. I'll just be holding up my apple pressing so you don't have to look at that giant hole punch the whole time. So let's talk about this cover art, or rather box art. That's how this album is packaged. Or most often packaged, I should say. In this photo, which I'm assuming is real since the official George Harrison social media accounts post it. He's posing with what appears to be a trifold version. If you have that version, let me know. As stated by Jason Green for Pitchfork, quote, with its grave, formidable spine, its symbolically freighted photo of Harrison in the country, pointedly surrounded by three toppled garden gnomes, it still sits like a leather-bound book, a pop music King James Bible on any shelf of records it occupies. Photographed by Barry Feinstein, on the front cover we have a photo of George on his estate, Friar Park. A very popular interpretation of this art surrounds the three gnomes. Once we get into the context of this album's conception, I think you can infer who the gnomes represent just fine. This cover has been remixed a few times, from subtle recolorings to a full colorization, even photoshopping urban development into Friar Park. Opening up the box, we have our credits on the inside of the lid, our three discs with lyrics printed on the sleeve, and a poster. I love this moody shot of George in front of his window, looking like every millennial man who enjoys IPA has backpacked Europe and owns a French press. I am so lucky to have a copy with a poster still intact. A lot of these guys got stuck up on bedroom walls and lost to the sands of time. As far as personnel goes, we are going from last week, the shortest this section will ever be, to this week, possibly the longest 
youngest on All Things Must Pass, we of course have George Harrison on lead and backing vocals, guitar, harmonica, Moog synthesizer, and acting as principal songwriter. And a litany of special guests, including but not limited to Ringo Starr on drums, Billy Preston on keys, friend of the Rolling Stone Bobby Keys on the sax, Dylan collaborator Pete Drake on steel guitar, Beatle associate Mal Evans on tambourine, and he can be heard in the group vocals on It's Johnny's Birthday. Illustrator of the Revolver cover, Klaus Vorman plays the bass, John Lennon and Yoko Ono can be heard on I Remember Jeep, on which Ginger Baker of Cream and Blind Faith plays the drums. We have Eric Clapton on guitar, Bobby Whitlock on organ, keys, and harmonium, Carl Radel on bass, and Jim Gordon on drums, and... Huh. That was weird. Anyway, Dave Mason of Traffic on guitar, with Peter Frampton of Humble Pie, Alan White, not yet of Yes, plays the drums, Gary Brooker of Procol Harum is on guitar, Jim Price plays the trumpet and the trombone, we have the entirety of Badfinger here, and Bob freaking Dylan. Kind of. He co-wrote I'd Have You Anytime with George and wrote If Not For You. All Things Must Pass features choral and orchestral arrangements by John Barham, production by Phil Spector with George Harrison, and was engineered by Phil McDonald and Ken Scott. Roll transition. <laughs> Where does one begin? I covered most of the Beatles breakup drama last week in the McCartney 1 video, just because it's most pertinent to how Paul was initially framed as the villain. Today we'll go through pretty much that same frame of time, late 1968 through 1970, but from George's point of view, a la the Sam Mendes Beatles films coming out in 2027. It's okay, Sam, I'll let you buy my script in exchange for a bit part as an Apple Scruff, or maybe Brian Jones recording Yellow Submarine. We're the same height, we have the same nose, I feel like we could work it out. Or, you know, money with which to pay my student loans. Quiet Beatle George Harrison has a lot on his plate. To escape the burgeoning Lennon-McCartney pissing contest, and Yoko. Yoko sat in that very chair. Oh. <laughs> George casts his gaze outward. In 1968, he releases his first album under his own name, the soundtrack for Joe Musso's film Wonderwall. I won't say much on the movie or the soundtrack since I really want to make a video on it, just know the film is a forgotten 60s masterpiece. In November, once the White Album dust has finally settled, George visits Bob Dylan and the band in Woodstock. This trip was revelatory for him. Firstly, he got to collaborate with one of his heroes. They co-wrote I'd Have You Anytime, a yearning love ballad. This visit forged a lifelong friendship between the two. George wrote Behind That Locked Door to coax him out of retirement after the Isle of Wight Festival. Secondly, John and Paul co-captained the Beatles' ship. That's just how it's always been. Historically, George only got two songs per album. Just because he got two didn't mean he only presented two. He got very used to songs getting rejected. Like, Isn't It a Pity, written as far back as the Revolver days, which is amazing to me. It was originally shopped around for the White Album, Although it was about a romantic relationship, the lyrics were weirdly perfect for current Beatle goings on. Seeing this egalitarian nature between Dylan and the band opened George's eyes to a whole new way of recording. He couldn't just go back to the way things were before. But he had to. In January of 69, Paul rounds up the guys for this big get back thing. Two important events in our story take place during these sessions, and no, I don't mean George's Les Paul falling over and Black, Black, Maxwell Silva, I'm a bit sure that she was dead. Or well, I, I don't want to go. I would like to go on the roof. Firstly, he presented a song called All Things Must Pass, a slow and pensive but no less grand tune inspired by Timothy Leary's poem All Things Pass and The Wait by the Band. This was another one he wrote while hanging in Woodstock with Dylan. It's a common misconception that Lennon-McCartney rejected the song, but as we see in the 2021 film Get Back, 
back, it was George himself who withdrew the song from consideration. If you ask me, he pulled it because the original Get Back concept was a no overdubbing live-ish album. See Glyn Johns's Get Back. All Things Must Pass just isn't that kind of song. On his 29th birthday, George popped into EMI to demo All Things Must Pass solo. The other major thing that happened at Twickenham was George reaching the end of his rope. Paul had no idea what Get Back was supposed to be, but acted like he did. This and the historic clickiness of Lennon-McCartney really ticked off George. And listen, as much as I love dear Georgie Boo, he was part of the problem. Instead of, you know, trying to talk things out, he pouted in the corner like a petulant child. On January January 10th, after an argument sparked by Paul criticizing his use of the wah-wah pedal, George walked out, had lunch, quit the Beatles, went home, and wrote wah-wah. He was coaxed back for sessions at EMI, but the damage was done. During all of this late 68, early 69 upheaval within the Beatles, George's bestie Eric Clapton is going through a similarly transformative time. Back in May of 68, Clapton read a particularly gnarly review of a cream gig in Rolling Stone magazine, written by one John Landau. So gnarly that he had a panic attack and broke up the band. What was he doing now? After that farewell tour, Robert Stig would force Cream into going on, and whatever the hell blind faith was, he started hanging out. <laughs> Get away from me! He started hanging around Blind Faith's opening act, husband and wife country rock duo Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett. They had a band, Delaney and Bonnie and Friends, including Bobby Whitlock on keys, Carl Radel on bass, and Jim Gordon on drums. Clapton adopted Delaney and Bonnie as his foster band of sorts and invited George to go on tour with them. Both George and Eric were hugely influenced by the band's first record, Music from Big Pink, so they really dug Delaney and Bonnie's kind of music. Like spending time with Dylan and the band got him to incorporate steel guitar and organ into his composition. Spending so much time with Eric renewed George's interest in the guitar. After all, Clapton is God. What else is George up to right now? He's doing the third most stressful thing you can do after death and divorce. He's moving. George and Patty's first home together, Kin Fawns, my personal favorite for all its art, by the owners, their friends, and the fool, was too small to accommodate a home recording studio. Plus, George and Patty really wanted kids and lots of space for them to run around. Thus, in early 1970, George bought and began restoring the 19th century estate Friar Park. Let It Roll is a tribute to its original owner, Frankie Crisp. He was an eccentric guy, so there was plenty of inspiration for a song. All the while, George scratches that creative itch with more non -beat Beatles pursuits. Last year, he did this weird Moog synthesizer thing for Zapple Records, one of two records ever released on Zapple Records, and produced for Jackie Lomax. This year, he's producing Doris Troy and Billy Preston. What is Life was written on the way to a Billy session. Abbey Road comes and goes amidst the long, drawn-out, and messy breakup of the Beatles. Alan Klein is hired as the new manager during production, and it all concludes with Let It Be and Paul's spectacular McCartney 1 release date bitch fit, which he was absolutely right to do. To that one guy in my comments who will surely be like, Uh, actually, Paul never explicitly said he was leaving the Beatles in his self-interview? There's this thing called reading between the lines. I suggest you do it sometime. Anyway, I detailed the whole saga last week. But it's worth noting that the last Honest to Goodness Beatles session, albeit sans John he was on vacation with, who else? Yoko, was to record I Me Mine, a George song. In May of 1970, the immediate aftermath of the Beatles breakup, George gathered his leftover Beatles era tunes, plus new stuff he wrote to process everything, and songs he wrote through other endeavors, like hanging with Dylan and Clapton. He rounded up his buddies and got to work, but first, he handed off two of those songs to Billy Preston to record All Things Must Pass and 
my sweet lord. George wrote the latter while on tour with Delaney and Bonnie and Friends as sort of an approximation to gospel. Either Delaney or Billy Preston gave him the idea, it depends on who you ask. It's worth noting Delaney is the only person who says it was Delaney. The song is about the desire to have a relationship with God, which can be applied to any theistic religion really. In the song, George combines the phrase hallelujah with the first part of the Hare Krishna mantra. He said in his book I Me Mine that he used Hallelujah and Hare Krishna together because they basically mean the same thing, just to different religions. Then a Vedic prayer that elevates the guru to some figures we've mentioned on this channel before. Brahma the creator god, Vishnu the sustainer, and Shiva the destroyer. As well as Brahman, which is so hard to explain, but it's kind of everything? The everything of the universe. It's the reason why. The one true answer. It's infinite. Brahman, the big, intangible, ever constant, yet formless thing. When we say Om, we're invoking that. At first, George was reluctant to record My Sweet Lord himself. He wanted to hand it off to the Edwin Hawkins singers, whose tune Oh Happy Day inspired his song's composition. Yup, that song. Nothing else. Billy's version came out a few months before George's. It doesn't contain the full Hare Krishna mantra or any of the Vedic prayer. It's basically the gospel interpretation of My Sweet Lord, which is super cool seeing as George wrote it as his Hindu answer to gospel music. Back to All Things Must Pass. The album, I mean. It was recorded through the summer of 1970 at EMI and Trident Studios. Sitting in the producer's chair was certified madman Phil Spector. Being the architect of the wall of sound that inspired such minds as Brian Wilson, Spector's approach to production was more is more. So much reverb it would put a slow dive album to shame. Big booming drums here, a horn section there. You get a guitar track, and you get a guitar track, and you get a guitar track. Everyone gets guitar tracks! Phil's ideas may have been out there, but sometimes they worked. To get that big resonant sound on My Sweet Lord, he had a giant plywood box brought in for five guitarists, including George, to play in. That's right, this isn't one track doubled or tripled, it's five guys playing the same part in the exact same rhythm. When you count the five acoustics on the core track, George's slide overdubs, a uh, more acoustic by George, there's at least eight tracks on this song alone. Joey Molland of Badfinger, who played on this one, said, quote, I remember hearing the rough mix playback. The balance was all there. It was so incredibly full. An enormous acoustic guitar sound without any double tracking or anything. Just all of us going at once, straight on. Sometime during the Trident sessions, a then 20-year-old Peter Frampton is called in to play one of these tracks. They'd worked together once before on a Doris Troy single, Ain't That Cute, and George was a fan of Peter's group, Humble Pie. This complete and utter maximalism wasn't just limited to My Sweet Lord. It took a damn army to record Isn't It a Pity. Three rhythm guitarists, three or four keyboardists, a string section, and a f***ing choir. Feeling that Paul micromanaged projects in the later Beatles years, Get Back especially, George encouraged the guys on All Things Must Pass to play it how they'd play it, not necessarily how George would play it. <coughs> That's how we got this absolutely gnarly clapped and lick in the beginning of Art of Dying, and extensive contributions from Pete Drake on steel guitar, including Behind That Locked Door, Let It Roll, and I Live For You, a song which didn't make the final track listing. The guys of Bad Finger recall that while George was the man in charge, he had a gentle, engaged teaching style, making the rounds to demonstrate on acoustic, but just so the guys got a sense of the changes. A Again, it was all about freedom of expression. Later in production, Bob Dylan releases his 11th studio album, New Morning. It's far from his Blonde on Blonde or Blood on the Tracks heights, but it's nice. I throw this on in the morning while I'm going about my routine. Of note is the album's opener, If Not For You. George loved it, asked if he could record it, and being partial to his little Liverpoolian devotee, Bobby said yes. So we get a swinging country rock version on All Things Must Pass. Amidst recording all the songs I've mentioned this chapter, plus even more that won't 
be named until the next. There were even more fucking songs to be dealt with. Stuff that arose in casual jam sessions. I remember Jeep was named after one of Clapton's dogs and features two thirds of Blind Faith. The core track was recorded on March 29th at Olympic Studios. Plug Me In is the recording debut of Derek and the Dominoes. Again, what is that weird noise? This session took place June 18th, just four days after their live debut. Because of course I share a birthday with Derek and the Dominoes, that's a little too on brand. Born of the same session was the single version of Tell the Truth and its B-side Roll It Over. Thanks for the Pepperoni was named after a line on a comedy album? Whatever the title means, it's a jam on Chuck Berry's Roll Over Beethoven, a song the Beatles would play in their early days. It's Johnny's birthday was commissioned by Yoko, see he doesn't totally hate her, as a 30th birthday present for John. It's set to the tune of Cliff Richard's Congratulations. Congratulations, it's Johnny's birthday. And Out of the Blue was recorded July 2nd, the last day of full band sessions. Looking at everything they'd cut. Somewhere around 50 songs were in the running for the final track listing. These jams weren't quite suitable for the core track listing, but too good to be left off. So a landmark decision is made. The Apple jams were issued as the third disc of a double album making All Things Must Pass Rock and Roll's first honest-to-goodness triple album. However, George didn't get exactly what he wanted with this track listing. He wanted It's Johnny's Birthday to come first, then everything else, and Out of the Blue to be last. He didn't get this because, well, he physically couldn't. Back in 1970, when vinyl was the primary format all music was issued on, you had to be mindful of the physical space you had on the record. There just wasn't the space for Out of the blue on the same side as I remember Jeep and Pepperoni. So it got bumped to the front of the line. Uh, important to note as we round out this chapter of the video, though Wonderwall and that weird Zapple thing technically came first, George considered All Things Must Pass as his first solo album, his first real statement as an artist. Now let's briefly zoom out to see the big picture. How did each of the Beatles cope with the slow, painful death of the center of their lives for the past decade? John caved in on himself. He immersed himself fully in activism and life with Yoko began the journey to face his demons head on through therapy. We don't get that statement until later though. As for Ringo, he regressed to a pre-Beatles state, releasing a standards album with some terribly underrated covers. Paul bolted, seeking shelter in domesticity with his new family. He leaves behind a little scrapbook of things that are important to him, intimate and vulnerable. But again, we don't get to actually hear how he feels about the breakup until Ram. George was the first to record and release an album post-breakup. On top of all of this, there were three and four LP compilations before, see the Woodstock soundtrack, but this was different. It's a curated, studio-made, three-disc product. It was a blockbuster in every way. All Things Must Pass was the first direct response to the breakup of the biggest band of the 60s. It was shaping up to be something big, and people were chomping at the bit to hear it. The track listing of All Things Must Pass goes as follows. Opening up side one, we have I'd Have You Anytime, followed by My Sweet Lord. Then, Wah Wah, and closing out side one, we have Isn't It a Pity. Opening up side two, we have What Is Life, then If Not For You, next Behind That Locked Door, Let It Down, and closing out disc one, we have Run Of The Mill. Opening disc two, we have Beware Of Darkness, followed by Apple Scruffs, then Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp with the subtitle Let It Roll, A Waiting on You All, and closing side three, we have the title track, All Things Must Pass. Opening side four, we have I Dig Love, then Art of Dying, 
Next, Isn't It a Pity version 2, for all intents and purposes, I will be calling this the Isn't It a Pity reprise. And closing disc 2, we have Hear Me Lord. Opening disc 3, the Apple Jams we have Out of the Blue. Next, it's Johnny's Birthday. And closing side 5, we have Plug Me In. Opening side 6, we have I Remember Jeep. And the album closes with Thanks for the Pepperoni. All Things Must Pass was released November of 19. 1970. On all fronts, this was a shock. It blew the record that coincided with the Beatles breakup. McCartney won out of the f***ing water. If Rolling Stone had something against Paul before, they were trashing him now. Because A, Isn't It a Pity and Wah Wah weren't just Beatles diss tracks, they were Paul diss tracks specifically. So B, if you were a George Harrison girly, in 1970, you were beefing with Paul personally. Man, 1970 really was Paul McCartney versus everyone. My man was in his reputation era. He did not deserve all that mess. For the love of God, he was the only Beatle who wasn't invited to be on this thing. All Things Must Pass's immediate hit status also overshadowed the subsequent Phil Spector-produced Beatle solo project, Plastic Ono Band. The lead single was supposed to be Isn't It a Pity, but they ended up going with My Sweet Lord instead, even though it's a double A-side single in the US. Anyway, what a decision leading with My Sweet Lord was. Of course, I can't let this chapter go by without giving a shout to the Temptations cover. George was the first Beatle to have a number one single on both sides of the pond. He was also the first to hold the number one album and single spot at the same time. I don't know how true this is. I sincerely hope it is. I've heard stories about him answering the phone at this time with... Number one recording artist, George Harrison speaking. Ah! I love it! But with that success came the legal debacle that makes Jimi Hendrix's Ed thing from a few weeks ago look like child's play. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, the My Sweet Lord thing. In January of 1963, a Lori Records group, you know, the label Dion was on, called The Chiffons, released their first single. Written by Ronnie Mack, He's So Fine hit number one on the Billboard charts the week of March 30th and peaked at number 16 in the UK. The Chiffons recordings were owned by Bright Tunes. Eight years later, George Harrison releases My Sweet Lord, and it sounds like this. My sweet In early 71, Bright Tunes sues George alleging plagiarism. The suit doesn't move forward for another few years, but in the interim, keep these three things in mind. Number one, Bright Tunes is already in some sh**. They're entering the early stages of bankruptcy. Number two, Alan Klein advised George to buy out Bright Tunes so he would have the rights to He's So Fine and all this crazy mess would be over. All of George's offers were declined under mysterious circumstances. And number three, in June of 71, Jody Miller released a country cover of He's So Fine with slide guitar on it, which made it sound even more like My Sweet Lord. When George heard it, he was shitting bricks. I like to be a pirate, a pirate's life for me. Speaking of covers, in hopes of capitalizing on the publicity of the suit, in 75, the Chiffons recorded My Sweet Lord. In February of 76, Bright Tunes vs. Harrisong's music finally makes it to court. Both sides bring in their experts, George brings his guitar, all of the girls in the courthouse fawn over the British guy with a guitar, I have no doubt. George's experts didn't deny he took inspiration from a song, but asserted the song wasn't he so fine. Instead, it was Oh Happy Day. Bright Tunes' experts, however, displayed undeniable similarities to He's So Fine. Same chord descending vocal line, same number of steps on the way down, and eerily similar key change and ascending melody, same steps up. 
On the stand, George admits that yes, he was aware of the song, as it was a moderate hit in Britain. In September, it's ruled that, intentional or not, George lifted enough from He's So Fine for it to be considered plagiarism. He's originally ordered to pay $1.6 million in damage, but... This ordeal is far from over. Back in 1971, George held the concert for Bangladesh, the first benefit concert of its kind with all his besties on the bill. Important as it was, this thing was a headache to organize from start to long after the finish. Lars Land has a fantastic video breaking down all the madness. It's linked in the description. How concert for Bangladesh went down led to George severing ties with Klein. Why? because he didn't register it as a charity event. Klein also waited until after he saw the bankroll to pledge proceeds from the show and album sales to UNICEF. Somewhere along the way, a dollar and 14 cents from each copy of the album sold just vanished, went up in smoke. And where there's smoke, Alan Klein is roasting marshmallows at the fire. By the time my sweet lord made it to court, Klein was long gone. Or was he? Remember when he advised George to buy out Bright Tunes? His initial buyout offers were all declined because Klein was feeding them insider information. Basically getting in their ears and saying, don't accept his offer, you can get way more money out of him. Then, in retaliation for the Beatles suing him, smack in the middle of My Sweet Lord Damages litigation in 78, who outbid George but Alan fucking Klein? That's right, not only did he snag the rights to He's So Fine, he's trying to steal my sweet lord from George. This guy is a cartoon supervillain come to life. This act of spectacular hubris worked in George's favor. In 1981, the judge took one look at everything going on, said, hell no, not on my watch, slashed George's payment from 1.6 million to 587,000, the amount Klein paid for He's So Fine, and awarded rights to the song to George. Ugh, the loose ends of this case wouldn't be ironed out until fucking 1998, the year before I was born. But when it's all said and done, I think this is the only plagiarism case in history where the defendant both lost the case and won the rights to the plaintiff's song. Is Stig accidentally suing himself a reference to this specifically? Somehow this nonsense didn't spoil George's love for his great hit. Quote, I know the motive behind writing the song in the first place, and its effect far exceeded the legal hassle. Surely this must be the end of the insanity surrounding this album, right? Right? Not exactly. We're gonna go back in time a few years to cover a lesser known but still important All Things Must Pass saga. Listen, George Harrison was always a flirt. He loved girls, and girls loved him. By 1970, his marriage was in trouble. Between sessions for All Things Must Pass and parties and chanting the days away, he hardly spoke to his wife, Patty Boyd, anymore. Plus, they were struggling. Plus, they were struggling to conceive. Amidst all of these stresses, stacking on top of each other, new house, new record, can't have kids but really want them, caused their relationship to fall to the wayside. At the height of the George leaving the Beatles during Get Back Sessions drama, Patty discovers he's having an affair. I guess he really does dig love. And she leaves him for a time. Who was this affair with? A French woman, a mutual friend, the couple invited to stay with them at Kin Fawn's. Who was this French woman? <laughs> oh my god, you guys are gonna die. Allegedly, allegedly, Charlotte Martin. Eric Clapton's ex-girlfriend, the one who ran off with Jimmy Page. This thing George couldn't undo manifested itself on the album in the form of Definitely Let It Down and Maybe Hear Me Lord. In recording with this group of guys, Eric Clapton, Bobby Whitlock, Carl Radle, and Jim Gordon, and in wake of this spectacular breach of Patty's trust, George accidentally solidifies the band that will end his marriage. In spending so much time with George, 
Eric falls madly in love with, or becomes obsessed with, his best friend's wife. And he's gonna do something about it. But that's a story for another day. For now, before I review my track listing of all things must pass, I have to briefly cover the existence of another, a second canon all things must pass, yes. In 2000, George oversaw a remaster or complete overhaul of all things must pass for its 30th anniversary. What makes it an overhaul? Well, he re-recorded My Sweet Lord for one. He gathered up some demos and more alternate takes and split sliced these bonus tracks into the original track listing. Sides one and two, or disc one since it's a CD, go as normal. Then comes I Live For You, where it was supposed to go in the original track listing, and then all of the bonus tracks before proceeding with sides three and four. That is unheard of. The other thing he did, since it was a CD release and he could, he reordered the Apple Jams. It's Johnny's birthday, then plug me in. I remember Jeep, thanks for the pepperoni, and finally, out of the blue, closing all things must pass as it was always intended to do. This presents an interesting conundrum. I have to grapple with the fact that due to the technological limitations of the time, this is not the final product as George intended it. If you want that, you have to listen to it digitally and try not to be too thrown off by bonus tracks being smushed in the middle of the record. So, what do I think of all things must pass. Whew, what a two weeks on Vinyl Monday this has been. A one-two punch of Paul actively spiraling and George just mercilessly slinging diss tracks at him on the way down. Going in, I am a George girly through and through, and it's because of this album. As gorgeous of a song as Be Here Now is, as killer as the Dark Horse tour was, as much of a hidden gem as the Wonderwall soundtrack is, all you really need to be a George girly is this album. This will not be the typical review chapter of A Vinyl Monday. There is simply too much material Material here to do a track by track breakdown. I only do double, triple, multi album track by track breakdowns in a season finale, and we're still six months out from that. Instead, I'm gonna do what I do with double albums. State what I like, state what I maybe don't like, and use songs to illustrate those examples. I'll only do in-depth analyses of those few songs I feel are just too important to pass up, but even then, one of my favorite things about All Things Must Pass isn't so cut and dry. After agonizing over this for weeks, I still don't know how to feel about Phil Spector's production. This dilemma I had was always this abstract thing until Giggins' spot on the Losing My Opinion podcast. I am all about an uncut gem. You can hear it in the Beatles jamming on All Things Must Pass in Get Back. These songs were gold from the jump. They didn't really need the polishing to be shiny. The wall of sound worked best when Phil had technological limitations to restrict him. Think Be My Baby, right? A four-track recording. By 1970, Phil could just go buck wild. See his dressing up of Let It Be that I do not like. It has gone from abundantly clear to glaringly apparent that I have to redux Let It Be. A recurring issue across this album, especially on earlier mixes like mine, my god the reverb. Wawa and A Waiting On You All are particularly noisy. I I feel like I'm locked in an empty, in an home, empty home depot. depot. The 2014 mix edited this, I think, uh, could be the 50th. It's not a nun specter by any means, it's not a let it be naked, but it is pared back. And the 50th anniversary edition features lots of demos. If this were a season finale, I'd be doing an all things must pass versus all things must pass, but we're still six months out from one of those. The one song I feel was polished so much that it took the patina off was Run of the Mill. I heard the demo first, as featured on early takes, 
This song didn't need the horns, the piano, the bass drum. Run of the Mill's message, a pretty even-handed observation that the unraveling of the Beatles' respect for each other led to the downfall of the band, uh, might be even more potent with the demo's stripped-back, off-the-cuff approach. The I Live For You demo won my heart because it's basically a 2008 Neil Halstead solo song, and I'm quite conflicted over the title track. I like both the demo and the studio versions for very different reasons. Since it's the thesis statement of the record, I don't know if it should be poignant for its grandiosity or for being quaint. So many of my favorite things about this album, the communal feeling, the glitz, the glamour, the maximalism, they come from the production. That is so against my usual taste. Exhibit A is the song we've already spent altogether too much time on, My Sweet Lord. Even if you're not capital R religious, it's difficult not to be moved by such pure joy and wholehearted devotion as this. Uh, unlike My Sweet Lord being given blockbuster status with strings and choirs like ten guitars works in the subject's favor. Have a song about wanting to reach up and touch your god? Simply make it sound like reaching into the heavens. My Sweet Lord is pure ascension. What is Life has a very similar appeal. I consider them sister songs. Let It Roll takes the magic of exploring a place time forgot and bottles it up. You don't just know the breeze. You smell it light and sweet in the guitar. You don't just revel in getting lost in the maze, you feel the joy of doing so in the harmonium. You don't just know go sweep the stairs, you hear them in the organ and in the chants of the mythical Frankie Crisp's name. If you're like me and you had a wild imagination growing up and made mythology out of everything, you're gonna love this song. And then there's Let It Down. My best friend Jack, along with the rest of the world, say this is an intimate, sensual, horny song about someone who very clearly isn't Patty. And I agree to an extent. The strings are exotic and lilting, we have those flitting slide licks, the verses are hushed. It's got the most earthly subject matter on the record for sure. But the chorus is bombastic. Big, booming drums and horns, the soaring choral backing vocals, a stomping drive. This grandiosity was smart. It's a ruse, a distraction from what's going on. I love it. Overall, all Things Must Pass was the Wall of Sound's last moment of lucidity, the last time it really, truly worked. After this, Phil slipped further into gun-toting madness and being an awful human being until he was made obsolete and rightfully so. What's a lot more difficult for me to argue with is the songwriting. A Waiting on You All and Art of Dying are fascinating glimpses into George's views on spirituality and religion. The Pope owns 51% of General Motors and the stock exchange is the only thing he's qualified to quote us. That is a banger! He writes of the temporality of life, articulated best on the title track. Naturally, the theme of karma comes up a lot. Isn't it a pity seems cut and dry on the surface, but there are layers to this one. George said, quote, it was a chance to realize that if I felt somebody had let me down, then there's a good chance I was letting someone else down. Good old Wikipedia says the, quote, lyrics adopt a non-judgmental tone throughout, and sure, the song starts that way, but any and all neutrality gets thrown out the window by the coda. The Hey Jude na na na's over top of a whining pity pity is George taking the night and twisting it. He had a lot of resentment and no idea where to direct it. After the McCartney one thing, Paul was an easy target. Was George right to unload on him? No! There's something very human about Isn't It a Pity. It started as a breakup song of sorts, written during the Revolver era, then became something else entirely. Evident of George revisiting this song after the Get Back blow up. Even the most level-headed and logical of people let their emotions win and relish in being a petty bitch. In the moment, it feels great, vindicating, but in the long run, 
it does damage. Hurt people hurt people, and here George is screaming, I'm hurt! For a moment, George forgot you get what you give. At the root of it all, this is why I'm a George girly. He makes music for the continually overlooked, underappreciated, and underestimated. If isn't it a pity is George throwing a tantrum, then he's calmed down by run of the mill. It's a lot kinder of an evaluation. Everyone has choice, whether to or not to raise their voices, it's you that decides. Establishes the core theme of this song, which even George lost sight of. You can't can't control how others act, but you can control how you react. Which way you will turn while feeling that our love's not your concern. This is directed at John specifically. Between drugs and going all in on activism with Yoko, he checked out. It broke Paul's heart and it pissed George off. But again, he says, it's you that decides. No one around you will carry the blame for you. He says, you can't shirk responsibility. We're all grown-ups here, we're all equally responsible for how this thing unraveled. Even if I'm mad at Paul because he didn't like my wawa. Tomorrow when you rise, another day for you to realize me or send me down again. As the days stand up on end, you've got me wondering how I lost your friendship. The Beatles weren't just bandmates, they were friends. They spent, like, every waking moment together for the better part of a decade. No one knew them like each other. To me, this is dedicated to Paul. George's plea for him to validate his feelings and assurance that he's just as hurt and confused as Paul is. But I see it in your eyes. My heart aches when I hear this line because I just see Paul saying and then there were two. The most personal songs to me are Beware of Darkness and Apple Scruffs. I realize this is a funny duo of songs to latch onto, they couldn't be more different. But both resonate with me deeply and they're back to back on the track listing. Beware of Darkness is a caution not to let conflict outside or inside win whether that's derailing your path to enlightenment or disrupting your inner peace. Beware the thoughts that linger, winding up inside your head. The hopelessness surrounds you in the dead of night. Beware of sadness. It can hit you, it can hurt you, make you sore, and what is more, that is not what you are here for. This reminds me of another lyric that hit me like a truck many years before I ever heard this. It's from a song called Hello Rabbit by my favorite band from college, The Mountain Goats. Uh, the line is simply, I did not come here to suffer. This is the root of Beware of Darkness. And in turn, why this song hit me like a truck. Loneliness kicks the sh** out of me. I do not do well with it. Nothing fulfills me like spending time with people I love and nothing drains me like being deprived of human connection. On top of that, I have the tendency to spiral. I am so fatalistic. Believe it or not, it's very difficult for me to zoom out and see the bigger picture. When I am at my worst, Beware of Darkness puts things into perspective. Life is not suffering. The idea that it is, is an illusion. Beware of Maya. Though hurting is a part of life, you did not come here to suffer, and you can't let that hurt make you bitter. On a lighter note, why do I love Apple Scruffs? Because it's a song written for me. Even though I never knew George, he wrote a song for me and all the other Beatles girls before and after me, past, present, and future, who would wait outside in the fog and in the rain for so much as a glimpse of the boys. As a female fan who loves so hard, it borders on groupy status, one of my least favorite things is the earnesty of my love being conflated with childishness. I have received comments saying I should grow up. Um, what they're really saying is stop loving openly. And also that they hate joy, whimsy, and fun. That sounds like a you problem, man. Losing the ability to love openly makes you bitter. I refuse to be bitter. Ever. Seen the passers-by all stare like you have no place to go, but there's so much they don't know about apple scruffs. People won't always understand this open, earnest love, and here George is defending it and thanking these girls for it. While the years they come and go, now your love must surely show me that beyond all time and space, 
We are together face to face, my apple scruffs. That says it all. No matter when or where, loving the music connects you to all who have loved it before and after you, transcending all of time and space. I've been saying this. Like my two favorite tracks, my two favorite lines on the whole record couldn't be more different. Daylight is good at arriving at the right time. It's not always gonna be this gray. And nothing in this life that I've been trying can equal or surpass the art of dying. A nice warm blanket and an existential slugger. What can I say? I am a Gemini. One of the things I love about George is how he always wore his influences on his sleeve. His idols were his besties. Of course, George invokes Dylan by inclusion of organ and steel guitar. Bobby was thoroughly in his country phase by now with Nashville Skyline and New Morning. There's Dylan-esque harmonica featured prominently on Apple Scruffs. There's Behind That Locked Door, a love letter to Dylan, I'd Have You Anytime, which he wrote with Dylan, a literal, actual Dylan cover song. The steel guitar is often layered up with the slide to create this delectable sound. See the My Sweet Lord riff played by both George and Pete Drake. There's prominent influence from George's other main bromance, Eric Clapton. The the buzzing opening riff of what is life, the expansive, wily art of dying, effects pedals like the titular wah-wah. God, I love this song. It's fun. It's petty as hell. George was unbothered. Even the guitar sounds sassy. But George didn't get the slide from Clapton. He bent the strings to create a slide-like vibrato. That's what he's doing on the Layla riff. George got it from records he and Clapton spun together. Delaney and Bonnie, the band, and Dwayne Allman. Worth noting Dwayne's claim to fame pre-Allman Brothers was playing on a cover of a Beatles song. Billy Preston and Delaney and Bonnie really got George thinking about gospel music and in turn, what spirituality really means. See My Sweet Lord, Art of Dying, but I wanna spotlight what I feel to be the most criminally underrated song on All Things Must Pass, Hear Me Lord. It's the summation of all of the best things about this record, the rafter-reaching production, the expert weaving of all of George's influences, and the arrangement, the stop times on Above and Below Us, and this tiny little solo are meant to stop you in your tracks. Ugh, the drama. You marvel at the monolith and you stop to appreciate the grass at its foot. But production can only do so much, right? You have to have good bones. Everybody is playing their hearts out. Big ups to Billy Preston and Bobby Whitlock on keys and organ, exchanging rhythm and harmony. These guys were the best to ever do it, and it shows. This song simply wouldn't move without them. The slide takes the back seat to the keys, but then around three minutes in, you get this growl. Four minutes in, it just takes off. Jim Gordon and Carl Radel ditch the shuffle and stride. Bum, bum, bum. As much as I love Georgie, his vocals weren't always there. You can hear it on the demos. There are some songs he kind of bites off a little more than he could chew or his nasally tone gets in the way. But he nailed it when it mattered and holy sh** did it matter for this. When it really sinks in what this song is, George pleading for help in wake of his unfaithfulness, whether to a god or to a woman, wailing for salvation with the tenderness and vulnerability that comes with his voice, you'll get choked up. As far as MVPs go, I reluctantly nominate Phil Spector, another reluctant nom, Eric Clapton. I thank all applicable gods every day that I don't find this man attractive. I may have historically dog sh taste in men. And when my taste isn't bad, it's just plain weird but at least I haven't stooped this low. But damn, if Art of Dying doesn't sway me, I regret to inform you, the lick is sexy. It sounds like it could be in the presence of the Lord solo and for the love of God, how many of these do I have? Five. 
I have five blind faiths now. Why do I have five blind faiths? Where Clapton really shines is the jams. Unsurprisingly, it's almost as if the format is his home base. I've always felt Clapton was on top of his game from blind faith through Layla. All things must pass falls squarely in the middle of that. On thanks for the pepperoni, that song title, why? He is so in tune with the band. That classic rock and roll drive is electric and it's exciting to hear because Clapton is such a blues guy. Oh, f I have to address the jams. I was torn on how to listen to these. Do I go by the OG track listing or do I go by what George wanted? I went with the former, but I vastly prefer the latter. Would I listen to the jams on their own? No, I don't seek out anything from the third disc, but do they have a purpose? Yes. To show what was going on in between the brilliance of the main stage songs. Newton's laws of physics state that a body in motion tends to stay in motion. I'd argue this is also true for creative minds. Though I vastly prefer it as an album closer, Out of the Blue is blues-based finery no matter where you stick it. Bobby Keys popping in on sax is the star of the show for sure. The other MVP who doesn't get nearly enough love Bobby Whitlock. What's the most magical thing about My Sweet Lord? The harmonium. Who played that? Bobby. The organ on Let It Down. Backing vocals on All Things Must Pass. That's Bobby. The keys that propel Thanks for the Pepperoni. Bobby. Goddamn. Between Delaney and Bonnie, Mad Dogs and Englishmen, Layla and this, everything he ever touched turned to gold. What an underrated talent. Considering all of this. I've somehow barely scratched the surface of All Things Must Pass because this is a lot of material. Did it need to be this long? I think yes. In an email about Broadway tours of all things, uh, one of my longtime viewers, Pat, said this about triple albums. Quote, even artists who have something to say rarely have that much to say at once. I agree. But George did have this much to say. Uh, sure, there are songs that I don't gravitate towards. I feel I Dig Love should have been swapped out for I Live For You. But everything is here for a reason. This is the only thoughtful, intentional triple album I can name. To attempt to round this out, because I feel Georgie would have appreciated it, I'll paint you a picture using a significant symbol to Hinduism. The lotus flower. What does the lotus do? It starts with its roots at the bottom of the pond with all the muck and stuff. Then it follows the light as it grows, up and up through the depths and the fronds until it breaks through the water's surface to bloom. It takes a long and arduous journey with lots of unseen toiling away to reach its fullest potential. Now who does that sound like? With All Things Must Pass, George achieved something very few groups ever could. He made an album so good, he never had to follow it up. For the rest of his career, he could do whatever he wanted because in one fell triple album swoop, he proved his motherfucking point. George had a long way to grow. As the petty moments here show, he still does. We only heard him when he reached the surface. Considering the army of special guests on this thing and all the shows he ever played, he may not have been the most confident front man, but on his own, he thrived. One could say he blossomed and he got the last word, proving he was far from the Quiet Beetle. My personal favorites are, oh my God, how could I ever pick? Um, uh, My Sweet Lord, Isn't It a Pity, Wah Wah, Beware of Darkness, Apple Scruffs, Let It Roll, Hear Me Lord, uh, Favorite Jams, Out of the Blue, and Thanks for the Pepperoni. Award for Best Worst Song Title, Thanks for the Pepperoni. If you wanna keep up with all of my faves from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it. That is the Vinyl Mondays. Monday season three mid-season special in the can. That was George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. What do you think of this album? What do you think of George? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.